Hey, small business people and lovers of good stories in general. Welcome to episode 41 of Small Business War Stories. This is a cool one. I sat down with Patrick Masterson in Louisville, Kentucky during my uh, Soul of America tour. And he is a letterpress printer, which I, uh, we'll talk more about exactly what that is. But basically what it is is uh, when you get a beautiful wedding invitation or other uh, documents been printed in relief, you can kind of uh, feel it in your hand. It's a beautiful, beautiful piece of uh, print. That is what letterpress printers do. And Patrick is doing that. And he has lots of good stories about it. This episode is a part of the Soul of America tour. And as a part of the Soul of America tour, it is brought to you by Tecovas Boots. That's T-E-C-O-V-A-S. They're awesome Western boots. And if you're tired of paying 700 bucks for handcrafted boots, you should check out Tecovas because they have very high quality boots, but they go directly to you instead of through dealers. So all the savings go to you. You should check them out. I wore them every single day of the Soul of America tour. Got lots of compliments. They're very comfortable. You can find them at T-E-C-O-V-A-S at Boots, TecovasBoots.com. The episode is also brought to you by Impact Crates. Impact Crates are made in the USA, strong, safe, and secure doggy crates. And my puppy, Muddy Waggers, traveled in one every single day. And they are very, very well made and out of durable, powder-coated aluminum. And if you use code MUDDY20, MUDDY, M-U-D-D-Y, 20, you'll get 20% off your Impact Crate. So go check them out. And the episode is also brought to you by Badger Mapping. Badger is the number one app for field salespeople in the Apple App Store. And it makes it easy for reps to manage their territory. So if you need to go where you need to go on a particular day and map a different a, a route and a, and a way to get around, this app is for you. I used it to map my all the different interviews that I had to do all over the country for the Soul of America tour. Now, like every business of small business war stories, this episode is brought to you by Proven. Proven is a company I started with my business partner, Sean, and it is a leading small business hiring tool. We are designed exclusively for small businesses. We make small businesses hiring easy. You don't have to go around posting to every job board. We make it easy for you to distribute to over 100 job boards. Thousands of small businesses use Proven successfully to hire. We use it ourselves when we need to hire. And check it out. There is a free trial Check it out at Proven, P-R-O-V-E-N dot com. Without further ado, I would love to get into episode 41 with Patrick Masterson of Louisville, Kentucky. Small business war stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. This is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes. And we are live here, and we are in Louisville, Kentucky, which I learned last night, if you say Louisville, Kentucky, you'll give yourself away right away as, as somebody who doesn't know what they're talking about. So in Lexington, they, to they taught me I need to say Louisville. So I am here very excited to host, be hosting Patrick Masterson of Patrick Masterson Letter Press Printing. Uh, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's awesome. And you tell me, so you are a native, but you say Louisville. I do say Louisville. I, you know, I, I think uh, <clears throat> leaving home, I was away for a lot of years. And, and I think probably had some self-consciousness about having an accent, trying okay. to lose that accent. The natives definitely say Louisville. Okay. But uh, I, I do say Louisville. Awesome. Louisville. So so basically you, you validate that it's okay to say Louisville because you, you, grew, you grew up here. I guess it's okay. <laughs> it, it's, I'm definitely, you know, you can't, can't uh, question my native status. That's but, awesome. Uh, yeah. That's awesome. So yeah, tell me a little bit more about, so um, I don't know that in, in the world there are that many people who understand that so much printing still happens in a non-digital manner, still happens. In, uh, so maybe can you, uh, for uh, you know, my education and, and everybody else that, you know, that may not know, what is letterpress printing and what it, you know, how, how is it done today and what inspired you to get into this? Yeah. Um, letterpress printing is, it is it's the original uh, print 
process. So, you know, Gutenberg was a letterpress printer. And <clears throat> what you are, or how images are rendered in letterpress is, it's referred to as a relief process. So you are inking a raised image, whatever that is, that, you know, could be type, it could be what's called a half tone, which is how you uh, render a photographic image in, in letterpress or in relief, um, you know, any kind of line art, and you're, you're inking that raised surface and pushing paper into it. But it's, wow. a, you know, again, it's a process that dates to, you know, I guess what, 1455, I think, was, okay. you know, um, is the date of the um, Gutenberg Bible. Wow. So, uh, so what's the main use of letterpress printing today? You know, today it's kind of a specialty medium. Um, I do a lot of wedding invitations, but, you know, I do, I mean, I've done everything from, okay. you know, business cards to posters and everything in between. I okay. mean, there are record covers yeah. that are so printed. So you're, you're on the far end of the spectrum. So if you were to have digital printing that's kind of completely digital, there's there's kind of like the Heidelbergs of the world and all that that do kind of like, what what's that called? That in uh, that type offset, of offset, offset printing, right? printing is, which is kind of between what you do in digital. Some yeah, way. it yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's that's not a bad way of thinking about it. I mean, everything, has, how all of these things work are are, um, are really um, unto themselves, I guess you would say. But um, you know, from uh, yeah. Anyway, that's okay. that's not a bad way of, of thinking about it. Cool. And things are you know um, just kind of workaday sort of print, you know, or anything that's printed is more going the way of, of digital printing. But, right. But, you know, so many things, you know, catalogs and things yeah. are all printed offset. You know, it, it's... Um, and the reason that people would use letterpress instead of either offset or digital would be mostly because of the aesthetic of it, the feel of it. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a very tactile medium. I should show you some samples at, at, at yeah. some point. And the, the aesthetics of it have changed over the years. I mean, again, it, it used to be the only way of, of rendering type. So, okay. um, you know, the New York Times was printed letterpress until the early 70s, believe it or not. Wow. So it's, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's gone through some changes of... Um, of how it's printed. Okay. Uh, or, yeah. So so now people are really emphasizing the impression aspect of it and using really nice papers and, yeah. and kind of you know showing off sounds a little crass, but it, it's kind of showing off the the kind of craft process, I guess you would Got say. Got it. Got it. So, and do people print books this way, or is it more of like a, a one-off, like for a, a piece of art or like an invitation thing? You know, people uh, people do print books this way. It, it tends to be more of a, um, <clears throat> uh, a you know limited run kind of special edition printing, but but absolutely, people people do print books this way. And do people ever use letterpress as a way to define an aesthetic and then go digital from there? So, for example, I shoot film, yep. which I then mostly scan into really high quality digital images and then use that. Do people ever do like something in letterpress? Absolutely. It's, okay. it's all over the place at this point where people are, um, you know, not, I, I don't want to say faking, but have adopted um, sort of natural uh, sort of tendencies or how letterpress renders uh, images. You okay. see it all over digital. Okay, but that, that could be, but that's different. That would be using the letterpress aesthetic. I guess what I'm asking is, do people ever print like one book in letterpress and then digitally copy that book? Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I don't know necessarily why you, why, why you would? would really. I mean, you know, there's a guy in town that's okay. a letterpress printer yeah. um, that designs wine labels. And he will, you know, he'll start on you know on a letterpress to render in a certain way but then you know those things you know go through an offset press you know he's kind of more using it as a design tool That's i guess you might say as opposed to you know a production tool cool. so so yeah i guess the answer is is yes or definitely yes awesome awesome so the, the, 
tell me, how is it that you get into this? I mean, uh, I, yeah. there are probably, uh, you know, you, you went to Columbia, is that right? I did go to Columbia. Yeah, and yeah. you had a, and you have a master's degree. The master's degree in, in writing. In writing. Yes. And yes. so there are many, many different things you could have possibly done. Why this? <laughs> Why true. letterpress yeah. printing? Um, you know, when, so I, gosh, I'm trying to think where to start. So growing up in Louisville, you know, it was a pretty active uh, music scene. You know, had friends that that did a, did a record store, did a record label, wow. and, and were silk screening a lot of things. So silk screening band shirts, and sure. silk screening you know record covers and things. So right. that was the first sort of instance of um, that you could make stuff of your own, right? right. Just you know, kind of not being a passive consumer yeah. of things, but uh -huh. really put stuff out into the world. So. It was kind of the original spark. I mean, it was just more kind of, you know, participating in whatever that community was. Sure. Um, and then, <clears throat> so wound up in graduate school at 22, you know, right out of undergrad, uh, was done with school at 24. And a lot of the writing that I was interested in at the time, and, and still am, is, you know, kind of I'm a guard writing where there there's lots of opportunity. I guess, you know, big publishers are not beating down those kind of writers' doors to, to publish stuff. So right. you have what the opportunity. Of, what kind of stuff? Well, I mean, you know, I, I was really, so I lived in New York at the time. Yeah. Um, and was inspired by a lot of kind of 1970s mimeographed journals and, you know, so like. What does that mean? Well, they were using mimeograph machines, so... It, I don't even you know, know what a mimeograph is. Yeah, is. so, I mean, they, they were everywhere. I mean, you, you know, the secretary at your grade school was probably running off newsletters off of a mimeograph machine. Okay. And truthfully, I, you know, I don't even know a ton about them. I mean, everything looks like it's all, you know, typewriter, you know, fonts, or it's yeah. a typewriter font. It's, and it's, um, you're using carbon paper to make the copies and all of those journals are just, you know, eight and a half by 11 sheets that are stapled up the spine. Wow. But, you know, I mean, truthfully, that's, I, I feel like I should know more about wow. how they were done. Okay. But, um, but just so much cool writing from the 70s in New York were, you know, were coming out that way. So there was a guy, Ted Berrigan, who did something called C Press. Um, there was uh, it's Angel Hair Press. It was the guy Lewis Warsh and Ann Waldman. Um, you know, I just uh, I thought the writing was so cool, and, and I thought that they were such um, active producers of it was really inspiring as well. So, you know, I was kind of trying to do the same thing. I mean, yeah. people that lived in that city that I knew or wanted to know that I admired, you know, you could you could work with them. People yeah. were really pretty accessible. So, um, you know, I think the first things that I did with uh, was with a buddy of mine from graduate school and we started doing little runs of and I wasn't even letterpress printing actually at this time okay. we were silk screening the covers and then running the books off digitally and uh, kind of hooked up with a little re reading series that was it was the Segway reading series which I think is ongoing has been around for a lot of years and just fantastic writers and, and started making books that way yeah. um, and then from there, I wound up working for a publisher in New York that I just admired editorially. It's called Granary Books, guy Steve Clay that's really kind of a visionary. And um, he, uh, he does a lot of or did a lot of really cool paperback books, but then also did these amazing um, writer and artist collaborations, so artist books that were really limited edition things, you know, 50 books that were just exquisitely produced that would wind up in museum libraries and special collections libraries. And I just, you know, I'd never seen anything like it. And all of the text was printed letterpress. So, um, you know, I was already interested in bookmaking, but I mean, just, you know, yeah. like nothing on the kind of scale that he was doing. Yeah. And, uh, so, you know, I think he, you know, he knew that I was interested and he introduced me to a woman who early on did a lot of his printing. Yeah. She'd kind of gone on to do, um, you know, more commercial kind of printing, I guess you would say, but just she was such a fantastic printer and really wonderful client list. The name of the business is, is Soho Letterpress. Her name is Ann Noonan and she's kind of a pioneer in the field, really. I mean, there's some things that she was doing yeah. that... Are just assumed with with anyone that's doing this stuff professionally. Yeah. There's now, a saying I heard. The there's a saying I heard the other day that is uh, there's a Jimi Hendrix of everything. 
And that's uh, fair enough. I think she was. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a little bit, a little bit. Yeah. Um, So I started working for her on Sundays, just trying to learn a little bit, wound up working for her full time and then, you know, really fell in love with it while I was working there and just lots of lots of cool people working there really really talented people a lot of people just out of art school so people from RISD and Parsons yeah. and kind of people passing through but just a, a lot of um, a lot of talent there um, and wound up from there at the um, it's the book arts program at the University of Alabama which is one of the few places where you can study this stuff in graduate school. So, okay. you know, you're learning letterpress printing, uh, paper making, and hand book binding. And wow. Kind of, you know, one thing led to another, and now I'm in business for myself. But You are making again. my typewriter sound positively cutting edge, because <laughs> this, is, this is going even further yeah. back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is, yeah. yeah. So, wow. Or the opposite of cutting edge, I yeah. guess, or sort of, you know, yeah. both sides of it, maybe. Very, very cool. Um, Interesting. Okay, so tell me, how do you turn this passion for really beautiful typography and design, and and it's really like a process. In many ways, it's like one of my favorite saying is that the medium is the message. Sure. You know, when you record yep. to yep. tape or you shoot film or like you write on a notebook, there's something about that that affects the what comes out beyond the actual mechanics of what you're doing. Um, so you obviously have an appreciation for that. How do you turn that into a business? Yeah, it's, um, well, I, you know, I think that when people, s- I think people see it and they get it, right? I mean, it, it really is a beautiful thing. It just feels great in the hand. Um, and it is, you know, I mean, you, you mentioned sort of the medium is the message. I feel like, um, you know, typography looks the way that it should printed letterpress. It really becomes this dimensional right. thing. And, um, you know, in a way, I mean, it, I don't know that it's the best response, but it kind of sells itself. I think it's really a compelling thing. I've really never felt like I've had to, to sell it or press it. Yeah. Uh, it's a terrible pun, <laughs> but, um, but people, you know, I feel like, you know, it wasn't long after just having my doors open and people knowing that I was open that business yeah. came along. You know, there, there's just certain certain projects that really make sense. Tell for me more, it. which projects? So you mentioned wedding invitations. Who are some of the folks that come to you yeah, for whom you're the obvious choice? Yeah, I mean, I, I do a lot. You know, it, it does tend to be, I guess, design-minded people, whatever that project might be. You know, okay. I mean, again, it really runs the gamut from, you know, I mean, the... The only thing that you're limited by really is, is kind of the, the size of the press that you're running, and then you know if you can, you know if you can produce that project, right? But you know I, I think it more. Um, I, I think it it is people that care about what the finished product is, you know what their sensibilities are. Yeah. And, and um, so, can you give me more examples? I mean, I'm just like I'm trying to put this, you know, kind of rubber meets the road. Again. Yeah. Well, I mean, not, you know, I think the idea of it is um, it's not throwaway at all. It feels like something that's really special. So, you know, what whatever the thing is, you know, if it's a, you know, if it's a music show and it's you know i think that people will notice that poster more than something that you know i mean i love stuff that you know i spent you know plenty of nights with people like kinkos you know doing stuff on a photo photocopier and i think that stuff you know is really compelling as well but it's you know it, it's eye-catching stuff you know that somebody okay. took the time and cared about whatever that thing is. So examples, so so musicians come to you for music posters. uh, Lots of business cards, lots of wedding invitations. Um, You know, I I mean, that tends, you know, honestly, at this point, I would say probably, you know, three quarters of my business is doing wedding invitations. But, you know, I do lots of business cards for, you know, ad agencies, architects, um, you know, again, sort of design conscious businesses that are, you know, want you to hang on to their business card. Yeah. <clears throat> but, you know, I, I, I mean, I got I printed, you know, multiple books letterpress yeah. as well. So, okay. you know, very cool. Could be anything. Very cool. 
And how do you find, you mentioned that not long after you were open, people were finding you. Um, how do you find most of your customers for this? Is it mostly word of mouth? Or? It is word of mouth. I am the world's worst marketer. I yeah. think, you know, at this point. You don't even have a really like defined never, website, right? I don't. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I looked at I had, it. Yeah, time. I had a splash page up at some point. And, um, you know, I'm not really the type of person to um, kind of, tout what I do, I guess, although here I am talking about it, but, um, you know, it, it, I've been spoiled in certain, I mean, it's just me, you know, and I, I'm busy all the time, but I'm kind of trying to keep it that way. Um, and you know what I've, I'm not trying to make it difficult for people to find me, but it's, you know, but it basically, you know, if you've gotten a hold of my telephone number or my email address, yeah. you know, that, that's kind of how it goes. And, um, yeah, again, it is all word of mouth and, and that, you know, up to that point, it's really served me well in the, I mean, I, you know, I hesitate to use this term, but the right kind of client seems to find me yeah. that way. I mean, I'm really at this point, you know, it's a lot of repeat people that I'm, you yeah. know, that are designers. Sounds a little bit like Fight Club when they make people line up outside of the house before they can come in. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think maybe not as, as gnarly a vetting process, but, um, yeah. but I, yeah, I, I'm, uh, I guess I try to stay busy doing the work and feel like that's the best way of marketing yourself. Yeah. It, you know, I mean, the, the, the beauty of this stuff is that I'm, sort of a virus on everyone else's stuff. So, you know, I've printed a business card for someone, they hand that business card out, yeah. but you know, a lot of times they wind up mentioning my name, honestly. Okay. So it's, you know, I mean, there's just dissemination of this stuff, you awesome. know? So I feel like it really is the best representation of, of what I do. So, you but, know, uh, again, so far so good with the word of mouth thing. This might be an, an odd question, but is there innovation in letterpress printing? Is there like, are there things that are maybe new and better ways to do that process? And how do you balance if there is, and you're, you're nodding head yes, and I'm like, okay, if there is, um, how do you balance the innovation and tradition of that? Yeah, the, there's definitely innovation with it. I mean, I mentioned earlier that it, it's, um, it's kind of had an evolving aesthetic and, um, you know, at this point, or, or, or the purpose that it serves now of really emphasizing that, um, you know, just that basic fact of pushing paper into an inked surface and really foregrounding that, um, you know, again, is kind of the prevailing aesthetic. But the way that I'm able to do this as a business now is um, that I am I'm printing everything from photopolymer plates, which, you know, I'm sure have been around for for some time. What is I, it? What is it? For? So, so it is a, it's a light sensitive plastic that you are, you know, I, I'll, um, you know, all the type that I do, you know, so people are, you know, working in illustrator or in design, um, you know, working off of digital design programs and then, you know, we're outputting whatever they've designed on the computer to a negative and I make a plate from that. Now oh, you've cool. made, you know, etchings, um, you know, by letterpress or by that same photographic process for a lot of years. I mean, for the past hundred years that's existed, but you know, in the past it was, you know, on magnesium plates or copper plates, yeah. which is just, it's much more expensive. It's kind of gnarly chemicals. So that's like the evolution of a uh, xylograph, right? What they used to do with wood, would they, where they would carve the negative of an image into wood. Yeah, that's right. That's, okay. I mean, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Which I'm, you know, <laughs> I know the term xylograph, which I, you know, I honestly, I don't even really know that. Do they, but do they, so do you then, do you keep, what do you, what happens to the negative after you're done printing? Do you just melt that down and make something else? I, <laughs> this, I, they are just piling up for me. I keep okay. every plate and every negative that I've ever used. I know that people do recycle those negatives. I think there's a certain amount of silver yeah. in them. But um, but I just have a stack of you know, <laughs> Got it. seven years worth of negatives, basically. Okay. Um, so, but anyway, that ability to go um, from the computer to the press is really why anyone is able to do this um, commercially at this point. I mean, otherwise, you know, I mean, just you know, I have you know thousands upon thousands of typefaces in 
every possible, you know, in italic and bold and condensed, yeah, you it. know, on a laptop, right? Yeah. But, you know, I mean, if you look over there, you know, that's one of those cases okay. is that's one, you know, one typeface. So, yeah. so you know, many, Bedoni, many, poster, italic, and 24 points, right? So I've got probably 250 cases of type, which Jeez. is a fair amount. That for, is a good amount of time. But when you think about, you know, so I have, again, I probably have 4,000 different typefaces, you know, which is not to even mention, you know, how many different cuts of that typeface and point sizes there are, right? I mean, you're talking about tens and tens of thousands of, you know, I mean, there would just be no way to store it, yeah. right? I mean, it's just sort of a logistical problem of, right. you know, not to mention setting all of it. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's made it to where I can, you know, I can print anything. I'm not limited by, you know, being in physical possession of that typeface. Not to mention, you know, typefaces just aren't produced anymore. Uh, that, so it's, it's, I, I lost like half yes. a thread there. So how is it that you can type, uh, do anything with letterpress if you don't have the physical? Just by you oh. know, by the computer, right? Oh. So anything that you're designing, you know, in, in Illustrator or InDesign, yeah. you can output that to a negative, you know, essentially the oh. same way you'd run that out on your printer, right? But it comes out as a negative as opposed right. to and then, just a sheet of paper. And you're taking that negative and, you know, just through a photographic process, rendering this plate. Got it. So you're almost yeah. making a custom, uh, you know, basically custom, f well, not font, but a custom set of letters for that particular project. That's right. That is limited to the particular to whatever, characters yes, that exactly. are coming out. Which we, you know, at the end of this, I'll show you some, you know, some spent plates. Yeah. But that's exactly right. So you're not, you know, then after the fact, you know, resorting that type into a case, you're just done with that plate. But that the plate sense. itself, you know, it is really, you know, minimal in terms of cost. Okay. So, so because buying, how much does it cost to buy a set of letters? I mean, they're really not, they are available. There are people with, you know, what are called monotype casters. You know, there's probably some people out there that are still running, you know, what are called linotypes that are, you know, they're referred to as, um, you know, kind of, hot metal right so somebody has this you know vat of you know of, of molten lead that gets you know gets cast as type so there are people that still do that there's not you know not a lot but um you know honestly i don't even buy type that way so we, you know okay. i mean you can find you know you can find stuff on it's out there you yeah. know i mean how you did you buy your, your i you know so i would go to a you know, you had, you know, different kind of web discussion groups and classifieds ads. Yeah. So there's a, you know, online kind of, you know, uh, it's uh, it's called Briar Press. Yeah. And they have a great classified ad. So I've bought type from Rock Island, Illinois. I've bought type in Birmingham, Alabama. And I've bought type in Knoxville, Tennessee. And from Birmingham, it just came from knowing a guy whose family had been in the printing business for 150 years. And he finally closed up and bought a bunch of, which I just bought with him. I've been trying to buy it off of him for the past 10 years. Okay. And he finally just sold it to me a year ago, which was a bunch of old wood type, which is really, really desirable and hard to come by okay. now. The, you know, kind of metal sort of foundry type is a little bit less desirable and there's a lot of it. Okay. You know, but I think, you know, a full California case of, you know, of something, I mean, it really depends on what the typeface is sure. also. But what's but your I mean, order anywhere from, I, You know, 25 bucks to 150 bucks. For the whole set. For the, you know, for a California. And there's even, you know, I mean, it, you know, a set is not necessarily a defined thing, right? I mean, it's, you know, it's counts of different letters, right? right? So I've got, you know, some California cases that, you know, not a lot of type and others that are, you know, about to fall out the bottom of it. There's so much type in it. Got it. Um, so that may know, limit it's highly you, variable. That may, if the number of letters you have might limit where you can print without or how many characters. You that's where, that's where the term, uh, out of sorts comes oh. from, right? Your individual letter is referred to as a sort. So to be out of sorts is Wow. Yeah. I yeah. did not know that. Mind That's your cool. P's and Q's also is, uh, right? Because P's and Q's, you're setting, you know, are you setting upside down in, a, yeah. in your composition stick? Yeah. But it's, they're easy to get yeah. reversed. How does the right? P and Q beat out the M and the W? <laughs> 
Fair enough. I don't know. Let's, you know, <laughs> see if you can get Very that cool. to catch up. So, no. so, yeah, exactly. Let's get, let's get it started here with Small Business War Story. So, what, what are some of the, I mean, since we're starting to go on this tangent, what are some of the odder, wackier things that you've seen in your line of work? I'm sure you've seen, you have a lot of stories of random stuff. You know? Yeah, I, I think a lot of the stories, or the stories for me, are about. <clears throat> Sort of in here in the equipment, I guess you would say, you know, yeah. I mean, no one's making this stuff anymore, um, you know, so you're kind of, you know, chasing it around wherever it is. So, you know, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, I just, you know, listed where, you know, my type has come from. I have, you know, a press from Massachusetts, another press from wow. New York, uh, you know. My third press is from uh, is from Birmingham. Yeah. Uh, my plate maker is from Texas. Wow. So, you know, what's, it, what's the craziest piece you've ever had to print? You know, I think probably it was probably the most extensive. Anyway, was uh, it was an envelope liner for Coach when I was working at Zoho Letter Press in New okay. York, and I think it was maybe. You know, it's like 14 or 18 different colors, wow. which typically for me now, I mean, like two and three colors is the most that I'll do. So, yeah. uh, and everything was on press sort of simultaneously. So, you know, I mean, it was like, you know, 14, 18 presses all, you know, you you wow. run whatever your you know portion of the uh, of the liner through That's crazy. anyway i mean it, it was really logistically a pretty complicated piece yeah. it's a lot so, of ink it's a lot of ink so you probably have a special set of clothes that you only wear in the shop I, you... you know i'm it's sort of a point of pride i think among print, printmakers to to work clean okay um so, you know, and I think a lot of trades are that way. You can tell people that do good work based on the sort of orderliness yeah. that they conduct themselves with. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, I'm definitely an advocate of, you know, I wear an apron religiously, but otherwise it's just lots of washing my hands. Yeah. But, you know, you really, um, there's a lot of, uh, you're kind of troubleshooting uh, to print as cleanly as possible. Yeah. So trying to be a surgeon of typography. That's right. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. But tell me about a time. How long you been in business again? I have been in business uh, for eight years. Eight years. So eight years is plenty of time for things to go south. A few times. Can you think of a time when someone went really wrong and uh, what happened and what, what did you do about it? Yeah. I, well, I. You know. It, I've been really fortunate that. You know, I've, I've always been busy. I mean, you know, it took me maybe, you know, six month, months in to really, you know, be busy every day. But since that time, I, you know, I've always had something booked. So I guess what I would say is, you know, it's more, you know, if I've messed up a job and had to reprint something, yeah. you know, which, again, I, I'm pretty... Um, you kind of learn your lesson with that stuff. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I mean, primarily just... Just got to own up to it. Own up to it and do it. redo it. Cool. Yes. So a lot of folks that listen to our show are either uh, currently operating small businesses or they just love good stories. I love, yeah. We love you guys too. Or they're uh, thinking about, you know, potentially starting a business down the line. What would you say is the number one lesson or piece of advice that you would give to people who are thinking about setting out on their own? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, in my case, you know, I, I think that um, I'm really passionate about the particular thing that I do, right? I mean, I, I don't know that I, although I guess I, you know, kind of come from, you know, a tradition of entrepreneurs. I mean, my father's a small business owner as yeah. well. My grandfather, the same thing. And, and I, I guess I like the independence that that, that affords, but I also... Um, you know, it, it's, um, there's a reason why I do this work, you know? Uh, um, I mean, every job that I'd had before I became a printer, I really hated. Okay. And um, from the time that I started working yeah. as a printer, it really ceased to, to feel like work to me. I've never, yeah. I, I've never uh, been bummed on a yeah. day where I've had to go to work, you yeah. know? It's almost Which, like... I can relate, like the Soul of America tour has taken an incredible amount of work to like line up all the logistics and I've driven 2,200 miles so far with a thousand more to go. But it's but a it labor of yeah, love, right? It I mean, it's like just, work. yeah, I mean, I, you know, I've, um, 
not to sound sanctimonious, but I, you know, I've worked so much harder than I ever have, but it just feels sort of like a natural expression. I'm really, yeah. I'm, I'm always psyched to do it. So I maybe really find am. like, you know, put it into kind of like distill that it's like find work that is like the expression of, of your soul such that it doesn't feel like work. Which is a tall order. I mean, it really, really is a tall order, but you know, um, something that feels natural to you, you know? I mean, it's, uh, <clears throat> you know, everything, I've realized that I love hands on anything, right? Yeah. So I'll do some carpentry work, you know, some woodworking stuff, you know, but, but my entire education sort of pointed me toward, you know, anything besides working with your hands. Yeah. And it took me until kind of my mid twenties to realize that was a really natural thing for me. I like, yeah. you know, moving around, you know, working with my hands and I, you know, yeah. You know, worked in publishing for a year and sat at a desk and just thought it would be the death of me. It was yeah. just awful. So I think really just kind of, you know, listening to those kinds of things, right? Um, it's really made a big difference for me. I would also say, you know, that, that um, I think just being reliable and honest with people really goes a long way, really doing a good job. I mean, I, I feel like... Um, you know, it, the, the personal relationships of this stuff really do come first for me. And, and, you know, when it is a business, I have to make money, but I'm not trying to, you know, bleed anyone, you know, dry from this. I really, yeah. you know, I feel like, um, you know, I, I just try to be really fair and really think, you know, I mean, so I primarily work as kind of a wholesaler. So I'm producing things for people that, you know, they turn around and oh. sell. So I really um, just try to, uh, you know, I'm really in it with, you know, the person that I'm collaborating yeah. with. And so really, for the wedding stuff, it's not necessarily a couple, it's maybe like a wedding planner or the, somebody. The, like and, and lots of, you know, invitation designers, yeah. you know, that's a lot. Now I do, you know, I'm open to the public and, and do design work also, yeah. um, but I definitely do much more kind of wholesaling, basically. Well, you open to the public asterisk, as long as they're willing to stay in the rain for two weeks outside. Yeah, and yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I don't want to discourage anyone. I'm, but, just, uh, I'm just playing with you. But I think, uh, yeah, well, and, and, you know, early on, I guess I, you know, I, I never turn down work. You know, I really, you know, say yes to everything and yeah. just, you know, do a good job on it. And yeah. I think that, I mean, you, you know, you have to do something that people want, right? Yeah. Um, and, and that's, you know, it can be a tough proposition and I've been really fortunate in that regard. But, you know, but there's all, I think there's, you know, people that do this stuff, you know, and, and are not successful either. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, be good to people. Be honest. Love go. what you do. You Love know, it. it's not that, not that complicated, or it hasn't been in my case. That's cool, man. So what do you want to do in the next 10 years? I mean, you don't, you just moved into this awesome space here, with, which Thank you. used to be a golf station in the golf 19, station, yes. what, the 20s? Well, so like it was a golf station from 1934 until yeah. 1988. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, kind of went into a little bit of decline. It's yeah. been, you know, just a mechanic shop, you know, they've sold tires out of here. You know, I, when I bought this place, it was, you know, there were 400, Used tires in the space. That wow! I had to, What'd you do with the tires? Ah, uh, they you know all got recycled. Okay. Which is not not cheap. I think I had to pay three dollars. You had to pay people. I had to pay people. Oh, to, yeah, I would think that yeah. somebody would pay you for that. No, well, no, no, no. You have to pay to. Yeah, I think it was like three bucks a tire or something. Man. So it was. Because yeah. don't they turn the stuff to like basketball courts and all that stuff? That, that's yeah and like yeah. you know kind of mulch and yeah. playgrounds and things yeah well you know, I guess there's, yeah so what do you want to do in the next 10 years how do you where do you want to take this yeah I well you know I, I um I love what I do and I and I love the um, honestly the way that I'm doing it you know I think that um, you know I'm a little bit of a crazy person in terms of um, you know the quality of it and, and I feel like if I'm doing it, I know that it's coming, coming out the right way, and there's kind of a trust with, um, you know, among among my clients of a certain quality that will be there. Which is, you know, on some level, as you know, as a business person, you are trying to make as, you know, as 
or it's a goal to uh, to grow. Yeah. But I think I've kind of uh, and I've kind of gone back and forth about it. But I, I honestly think it'll still just me yeah. in here printing. Yeah. You know? I mean, so, so, I mean, Kurt Vonnegut said that you are who you pretend to be. So be really careful about who you pretend to be. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, if if this is your thing, what you want to do, I don't think that growth is necessarily has to be an yeah. intrinsic goal of running a successful business that has yeah. a positive impact. In your yeah, career. I think you know I've kind of I'm pretty happy where I am. So if yeah. I you know if I get to keep doing it and in, in in the way that I'm doing it yeah. now, I'll consider myself extremely fortunate. And and you're in your hometown. That's right. That's what's, right. What's it like to do business here? What's uh, what's it like to what's your relationship with other small businesses with the government? Yeah, um, so so I have sort of an odd relationship to the town okay. um, in that I opened my business in Birmingham, Alabama, and you know, and prior to that, I had been working for a design firm there, um, and and that that kind of provided an initial network for me that was great, mm-hmm. um, and. By the time that I moved my business up here, I really already had a pretty good client list that kept me busy day to day. So, I mean, a little bit of that, you know, that kind of goes back to the not having a website and whatever, you know. Um, So, I mean, I would say, you know, I'm doing some things locally now. I mean, there's a, you know, a cool uh, restaurant in town that I'm, you know, this week I have to print their business cards. But but truthfully, you know, Louisville clients are maybe you know, five to 10% of my business. Okay. And then, you know, it's been, you know, uh, but then all, I mean, clients in North Carolina, Tennessee, yeah. Georgia, Alabama, yeah. you know, I mean, it's kind of, you Is know, Louisville a business friendly city? Do you feel like talking to people, other people in the community, do, do you feel like, uh, you know, it's, I do. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's a place that really, um, prides itself on, um, on supporting small businesses. Yeah. So, so absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yes. Cool. I think there's, you know, definitely, you know, as much appetite, or, you know, and I, I think, yeah. um, you know, at some point maybe I'll, I'll sort of open myself out to the city to, a little bit better than, than I have. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I'm really, uh, okay. just trying to keep up. Well, along those lines, what else do you want people to know about your business and where can people find you? Not your website. So <laughs> <laughs> do you have an Instagram or Facebook presence? Anything like that? Uh, God, you know, my, uh, my wife set up an Instagram for me, you know, years ago and, and you know, uh, it really it's something that I need to, to have be a little bit more active. Got maybe, it. maybe okay. this will be All right. even necessary. All right. So what is the best way for people to get a hold of you other than coming outside the Gulf station and standing in the rain? Yeah. I, truthfully emailing me, <laughs> okay. which is absurd, yeah. uh, but not, uh, yeah. it, or send it your works. A, a carrier pigeon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which my email address is, uh, it's P T Masterson at gmail.com okay. or call me, which is, you know, I don't know that I, it's, yeah, you can call me. It's 502 550 6661. Yeah. That's, and that's the oper- how people can... And the operator will connect you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's awesome. Exactly. Well, Patrick, thank you so much for sharing your story and for sitting down with me today. And uh, best of luck in your new shop and congratulations. Thanks so much. Really Appreciate a pleasure. It. All right. Yeah. Thank you for listening to Small Business War Stories. If you enjoy the show, share it with a friend, or you can subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or on our blog at blog.proven.com. If you have an idea for us, we'd love to hear it. Please email us at podcast at proven.com. See you next time. Small Business War Stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes.